Excellent. Thank you, Pablo. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, present this morning. Uh, as Pablo said, I haven't been alive for 44 years, but it's my uh, you know, distinct honor and pleasure uh, to give this talk for Dr. Scott Mubarak. Uh, as most of you might know, he recently retired on the 1st of July and is now exploring the South Pacific uh, with his wife and having a fantastic time. These are my disclosures, but nothing is uh, relevant to this talk. Um, you know, the funny thing with Dr. Mubarak, you can always uh, tell what decade a photo is from based on the height of his hair. Uh, so based on the size of that Afro, I'd say this is probably somewhere in the 1980s. And around that time, this was me very excited that Dr. Mubarak had uh, explored the Pavlik harness and had become such an expert with it because I was looking forward to uh, learning from him over the years. So my task here is to talk about the public harness, and I wanted to put a, a Scott Mubarak spin on it by talking about all the amazing articles that he's published and the enormous influence that he's had on our program here in San Diego. So I'd say the public harness is the gold standard for the treatment of infantile DDH, and it's been the method of choice. Uh, it's been around for 75 years, uh, described in 1946. And if you think about all the surgical techniques that have evolved over the time, over the years, it's amazing that this uh, brace has uh, stood the test of time. So I wanted to spend the next few minutes uh, talking about why. So a little bit has to come from the man himself, Dr. Arnold Pavlik. So he lived from 1902 to 1962. And Dr. Mubarak and uh, Victor um, Bielik uh, uh, published this paper in uh, 2003, uh, where they went back to Pavlik's uh, home, met with his son, who's the third man here that Dr. Mubarak is shaking hands with, and uh, got into the history of when and how this brace was developed. So just to give a little bit of historical perspective, uh, Adolf Lorenz in 1896 described closed reduction and plaster casting this was a very forceful reduction of the hip, and he had a very high risk of avascular necrosis. So people were looking for different, less aggressive methods of getting the hip reduced. Um, just to put things into reference, you know, x-rays were described in 1895. So this was right around that time period when uh, dislocated hips were um, diagnosed, and we could follow their evolution over time with x-rays. Uh, so the Frika pillow was developed in 1941, the von Rosen splint in 1962. So in between those, Pavlik was born in 1902 in Czechoslovakia. He had gotten his degree in 1930 and joined Frika uh, to practice in Bruno. He actually developed the harness during World War II. Uh, so during that period between 1939 and 1945, he initially started making uh, the harness out of wick material because there were leather shortages uh, during the war. And then he finally described it at the Czech Ortho Society meeting in Prague. And more than just the harness itself, I think it's, it's uh, primarily focused on his concepts of a functional treatment for a dislocated hip. So the key principles that he liked to focus on was to maintain the hip and knee in flexion and abduction, maintaining motion so the child actually determined the level of abduction of the hip. And he emphasized dynamic, gentle, and a simple approach to getting the hip reduced in contrast uh, to the aggressive closed reductions. So he published a series of five articles in the 1950s, and his fifth and final paper really focused on, uh, you know, there were some attacks on him about this concept of dynamic reduction of the hip and the use, and the use of a harness. Uh, so he tried to address his critics in his final paper. Um, so it's amazing that it's even, you know, left Czechoslovakia and got out uh, to all of us, because I'm sure most people on this panel are currently using the public harness, uh, because it was developed under Nazi rule. Uh, his papers were presented in Czechoslovakia. No one really went out to visit him. And the news of this brace and this treatment reduction concept spread really slowly. But Dr. Mubarak gave me some interesting insights about how this was presented at a CECOT meeting in 1963, um, discovered by you know, um, Dr. Blount, who promoted it to Dean McEwen, and then they brought it back to um, uh, the United States and then published on its success and its use. So why is this harness so successful? Uh, 
I think primarily because it focuses on this dynamic motion of the hip using hip flexion and abduction, um, you know, the, the main straps that hold the hips in flexion and abduction to get the hips reduced. And then the child sets its abduction. So at Radies, it's currently the standard uh, care. And despite when we diagnose the uh, DDH and despite where on the spectrum the DDH is, so dysplasia, subluxation, dislocation, the answer is always pavlocarnus. So it's interesting when I'm teaching residents and fellows, we go through this whole spectrum of disease and how important it is to diagnose exactly where they are. And then the answer at the end is always pavlocarnus. So, um, so there are some uh, challenges with the pavlocarnus. And I wanted to kind of skip into that. So the goals of treating a dislocated uh, infantile hip, the first goal is to get the hip reduced. The second goal is to keep the hip stabilized. The third goal is to correct any residual acetabular dysplasia that's present. And of course, to accomplish all of these goals without any complications and primarily avascular necrosis or re-dislocation. So we use uh, ultrasounds weekly until the hip is reduced, um, and then we continue it for about three to four weeks. Uh, and if the pavlet does not work, then we definitely go on to other options, such as the abduction brace, which Woody is going to talk about, or going on to closed versus open treatment. Dr. Mubarak published this article, Pitfalls of the Pavlic Harness, in 1978, talking about all the issues that could go wrong. First of all, there is, you know, some slight complexities to using this device and proper education of how to apply it, uh, placing the first strap at the level of the nipples, uh, shoulder straps going around the shoulders, followed by uh, making sure that the heel is back into the strap going around the leg and that um, this, uh, the strap uh, is right um, below the knee in the, in the crease. Uh, and then setting the hip flexion, making sure that the child is able to extend their hips to a 90 degree position, and then finally setting the abduction strap. So there is some uh, getting used to it. And now we have some fantastic videos uh, on the IHDI website to help parents. But despite that, you know, we see kids in all uh, interesting variations of how the pelvic has been applied with the first strap down by the belly button, crisscrossing straps in the front of the body instead of the back. So many, many issues that could go wrong. The other main thing to look out for, uh, like Dr. Kasser had mentioned, that some of these hips can have teratologic dislocations or underlying disorders that aren't diagnosed early in infancy. So it's really important to find those as they tend to be the failures of um, the pavlocarnus. Mm -hmm. And finally, the parents as well. So this is a funny photo of Dr. Mubarak's son, who was not very happy of Scott applying the, the brace on their child at the time. But it's very common to get parents who are, you know, questioning your treatment strategies and, you know, placing their beautiful infant into a harness uh, at a very young age. So it's important to work with parents, have a system set up where your nurses can spend extra time with them, educating the families on how to apply these harnesses. And then finally, the physician. So, you know, sometimes we work too hard to try to get the hip reduced. And if we flex the hip too high, we have a risk of getting a femoral nerve palsy. And if we place too much abduction on the hip, there is a risk of avascular necrosis. So it's important to set that amount of abduction. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through some of these slides where we talk about, uh, you know, diagnosing um, hip dysplasia in breech babies. We always get an ultrasound at around six weeks of age and then follow up with an x-ray at six months of age uh, because some of these studies out of San Diego have shown that there is residual dysplasia that can be identified. And then um, our protocol for using an ultrasound has improved our ability to diagnose and treat these Ortolani positive hips uh, and um, improved our success rates from the mid 80, 80th uh, percentile into the 90th percentile. So I think it's really important to follow kind of a consistent methodology for following these hips as they get reduced and they continue to improve over time. Perfect, Pablo, I think I'm gonna stop it there for you to keep, keep everything on time.